Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Yeah, it just reads here, length of braided white rope, quarter inch in diameter, approximately 15 inches in length, noose fashioned on one end, uh, around the neck of Baxter Bryce Durham at his residence on the night of Thursday, February 3rd of 72. So, if you, you, I'm not going to open it because it sure. is sealed, yeah. but you can get a picture of it if you need to in regards to... As far as physical evidence, that's really all we've got it, is yeah. the possibility of that with, I mean, the possibility of the... There's a lot of weird shit well, about the, this case. The hard part is the 300 people that walked through the crime scene. Right, right. That, that's my point. Yeah. I mean, it could have been anybody. <laughs> Forensics and crime scene, not like it was. It was very different 50 years ago. Right. As I began to look further into the deaths of Bryce, Virginia, and Bobby Durham, it became clear to me that if I wanted to really get a sense of what happened and how it all came together, I needed to go to the town of Boone. I need to see this place for myself and get a sense of what life is like there now and see how much it's changed since the 1970s. Did the Durham murders still hang over this small town so many years later? From Imperative Entertainment, this is Season 2 of In the Red Clay. In October, I made my way through the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains, which were in their full autumnal glory. Splashes of yellow, red, and orange trees lined the hilly road that leads you through the mountain pass. I descended into the small valley where Boone sits, as if the town had been plucked from somewhere else by a giant and laid to rest here. Whenever I'm in the field researching a case, the first thing I do is hit the streets, get a feel for the town I'm in, for the people. I overhear their conversations, trying to get a sense of what the community is all about. You can learn a lot about a place by just sitting back and observing. I ask the locals if they know of or have ever even heard of whatever it is I'm researching. And in Boone, I'll admit, I was a bit surprised. Do you know uh, about the Durham case? Durham murders. Uh, the Durham family? Was in the news earlier this year. Never heard of it. it was in the 70s, but it was in the news. My server at dinner had no idea who the Durhams were, or that this notorious murder had ever happened. But he did confess that he gets most of his news by skimming stories on Instagram. And when I grabbed a coffee the next morning, I asked the two young guys working there the same question. Do you guys know anything about the Durham murders? The Boone murders? Never heard about that? No. Is that what you're here for? Now, granted, each of these people were in their early 20s at the oldest, students at Appalachian State College. It seems that people under a certain age just have no idea about the case, even though it made national news just months before. But for the older generation, it still holds true that this story is very much a part of the historical makeup of Boone. And someone who would know the sheriff who closed the case. My name is Lynn, L-E-N, Hageman, H-A-G-A-M-A-N. 
sheriff of Watauga County, North Carolina, since 2006. Hageman has been involved in law enforcement there since the 70s, which is how he first became involved in the Durham case. Well, back then, of course, the university was here, but it wasn't as large as it is now. It was pretty much rural still. Uh, Tobacco and cabbage were still the main business of the county. We still had a lot of seasonal people because people would like to come up here in the summertime because it's, you know, 72 degrees versus 90 or 80 or whatever. And then they, they, during that time too, uh, they developed a ski slope and other ski slopes developed. And so it started to grow, but back then it was still pretty rural. Everybody knew everybody. You know, we knew, you know, where the stores were. There, were, there wasn't anything like there is now with, the, you know, the Walmarts and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the way it was then. Now, I get a little more background on the town as it was in the 70s. And the sheriff tells me how he came into law enforcement. I saw this advertisement for a juvenile officer. I said, you know, I can do that. And so I worked my way up to assistant chief. And it was during that time that the then sheriff, Ward Carroll, here was not really working on the case in that much uh, because it was... It wasn't a priority for them uh, because it was just crazy. So we asked if if we could work it with the with the SBI agent that was here. So uh, Sheriff Carroll gave his blessing and we worked it. In my time podcasting, I've had the opportunity to sit with and interview dozens of law enforcement officials of every different rank. And Sheriff Hageman is by far one of the nicest and most welcoming of the bunch. He's fairly quiet, mild-mannered, and kind. When he began to reinvestigate this 50-year-old cold case, he was starting, much like I was, from scratch. My only information that I had, I I obviously did not go to the crime scene at the time. The information I have is what we gleaned in in interviewing people and and reviewing the the photographs and everything at the time and the articles and all that. And, And I really didn't even know that there was a file here until... 2006 when I was elected. There's very few field notes, uh, you know, investigative notes. There just wasn't that much, much done. And, and so the, the information that we had, that, that I had prior to learning of this file that was in here, there's a big hole missing there other than, you know, what, what we read and what we saw in those photographs and what we learned in inter- re-interviewing people. There's so much that was missing. The lack of evidence and proper notes being taken during the investigation goes back to 1970s police work. They just weren't prepared for a crime like this, and they weren't trained for it either. Back then, the police department would answer calls for the sheriff's office. There was no 911. It was a seven-digit phone number, 264-8851, Amherst 48851. Rural roads didn't have names, and your house wouldn't even have an address number. You would instead have a line of mailboxes at the end of the road with a number on each one. So your address might be something like Rural Route 2, Box 5. So just finding the house where a crime was committed was even harder than it is today. And then, of course, the sheriff's office back then did not have, you know, investigators. They didn't have crime scene people. So it was kind of a hodgepodge of... of people that, that were that were here. I had to ask the sheriff, is this case really closed? Well, from where I'm standing, you know, it's we've we've gotten closure and I'm convinced that they that what Davis had told us is, is accurate. And there's been some criticism about about what we did because there wasn't any closure. Well, I'm sorry, you know, the main guy that I thought from day one, can't talk to him. He's dead. But I think now because of, you know, social media, oh, they want it, they want, it's got to be, you know, somebody knows something somewhere. And somebody probably does. But where they are and how you go about finding them, I have no earthly idea. Good point. If there is someone out there who has more information, then they've likely kept quiet for decades. Except for Davis. It all comes back to Billy Wayne Davis and his confession. But remember, Davis said that he was only the driver. He didn't put himself going into the house. He said he dropped him off. 
he didn't go in the house because I think he was afraid that, you know, that would implicate him. But by the same token, when he was describing things, the weather and, and you know, almost getting caught and where he parked and, you know, this, that and the other, it was like, he almost had, he knew too much about the interior. And I don't think that the other guys, you know, Gaddis and, uh, would, would reveal that. Whether he went in the house or not, but he, he, he would not implicate himself in that. Like I said, he would go to the precipice and he'd pull back. Really didn't think about it in, in terms of that, but I, I said, you know, we're not going to charge you. We're here for closure. Davis told investigators that he dropped Bert, Gaddis, and Reed off at the Durham's house and then left, parking at a nearby market to wait, having never gone inside the house. But how do we even know that he was telling the truth? Did he describe anything in the house, or what, what made you... Well, I think some of his responses, he... I don't think that Bert and, and the other guys were sitting there talking about, hey, you know, this is what we did. There was a, there was a gunshot in the wall. You know, we, there was the phone. We did, you know, the, the strangulation and putting him in the bathtub and, and all the other and almost getting caught. And, you know, the weather was bad and on and on. I, I, he, just, he, just, he, just didn't, he just didn't put himself in there. And again, I think he was afraid that he was going to be charged. And I don't know if that's something in his mind that would make his family look bad or what. I don't know. But once we said, you know, hey, it, like, it was like a, a pall had been lifted from him. And it was like a burden had been relieved. I mean, you could physically see Davis kind of go, oh, I'm not going to be charged. Cool. And we explained to him, you know, there was, there was a surviving daughter and there was a surviving brother of Bryce's that they they needed closure. He did ask you know, if we would, in essence, help get him out. And I said, well, you know, we're in the, this isn't our jurisdiction. We you, you're talking to the wrong person. But I think that he's he's hoping still to maybe he'd be sprung when they they're not going to do it. Success is getting your foot in the door of a career, but now you want to take the next step. No matter your goal, University of Maryland Global Campus can help you get there. And with the next MBA and graduate cyber courses starting January 11th, there's never been a better time to focus on your future. Enjoy personalized advising that helps you along the way and online hybrid courses that fit today's schedules. Plus, UMGC makes an accredited online education more affordable with scholarships, interest-free payment plans, and no-cost digital resources replacing textbooks in most courses. Choose from graduate cyber degrees and certificate programs in technology, management, forensics, or gain a global perspective with an online MBA and receive lifetime career services at no additional cost. MBA and most cybersecurity courses start January 11th. Gain the credentials and specialized skills that many of today's top employers are seeking. Learn more at umgc.edu slash podcast. Certified to operate by Chev. Hi, I'm Jake Adelstein, author of Tokyo Vice. I've been covering Japan's criminal underworld for 30 years, and I've seen more people disappear than I'd care to, including my old accountant, who, as it turns out, was getting up to a lot more than taxes. My co-host, Shoko Plambeck, and I are tracking him down. And along the way, we're exploring what's really happening with Japan's missing people. We call them Johatsusha, or The Evaporated. From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, The Evaporated, Season 1, Gone with the Gods, is available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes, or listen weekly wherever you get your podcast. Davis, it seems, only opened up about his role in the murders when he was assured that he wasn't going to be charged. Really, there would be no point, legally speaking, because he's not getting out of prison anyway. He's 81 years old now, and apparently the effects of his hard-lived life are beginning to show. When we first saw Davis, he was at uh, at the central prison. The next two times when we saw him, he was at the hospital. I didn't see much of a deterioration at all mentally, but he was, towards the end when we, when we saw him the last time, he was, 
He was walking, but he was kind of, I mean, the guy's, he's 81. So he was showing signs of that, but, you know, mentally, he's sharp as a tack. But physically, I think some of that's starting to catch up with him. When the sheriff says that Davis was at the hospital, he's referring to the medical prison he was relocated to in Augusta, Georgia. Davis was sharp as a tack mentally, and he would only provide enough information to allow the case to be closed. He wouldn't implicate himself as being part of the actual crimes committed. You know, and, and Davis, he's a smart cookie too. He would get up just to the precipice and then he would walk back. And the last interview we did with him, I mean, here he is, he's on death row, or was on death row, uh, that commuted to, to life. And he was actually concerned that we were gonna charge him. And I told him, I said, look, our main thing is for closure, given the survivors that are left. Because when we were investigating it with the SBI and then Attorney General Rufus Edmiston, the family wanted closure and they never got there because there was never that connection. Nobody, you know, everything that we investigated was hitting up against a brick wall, including the interviews with, uh, with Troy and Jenny. You know, it just didn't go anywhere. That's why I think, you know, Davis didn't admit it going in, but he, some of his responses, he had to have seen some things. Yeah. Sheriff Hageman said that not everything was based solely on Davis's word, though. A witness claimed to have seen Davis that night. This person that saw this car that was backed in at one of the, it was probably the first convenience store in Watauga County. There was a, this guy went by and he said, that's unusual. There's a you know, a, a non-four-wheel drive vehicle out. Of course, four-wheel drive then was like the, the Jimmy or a Jeep or something along those lines. It wasn't like everything all-wheel drive now. But he remembers seeing a car there. He just said, oh, that's unusual. And he could see the, because it was cold, that he could see that the engine was running. And that fits with where the house is here, where the church is here, and where the convenience store is. The passerby saw a non-four-wheel drive car backed into a parking space at the market. And because it was so cold, they could tell the car was running because the exhaust emanating from the rear end was visible. During his interviews, Davis mentioned that after he dropped the other three men off at the Durham's house, he then passed by a small church on the way to the market. Well, he, he said he parked away from there, so that's probably his car. But... He did say, yeah, there was a church there. And everybody was saying, no, 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 there's not a church on that road. And I said, yes, there is. Yes, there is. And then he said he gathered the guys up, and then that's when they started going back to, to Georgia, and that, that's when, suppose, or when Burke said, you know, he got ripped off, and then and, and that they almost got called and all that. If this is accurate, does it provide proof that Davis was there? Does this mean that Stoney's theory of Davis making a deal with authorities is nothing but wishful thinking? Part of the story Davis told investigators was that Billy Burt, on the way back to Georgia, was angry that he had been ripped off. It's unclear exactly why, but theories are that he was expecting to find more cash in the Durham's home. This story sounds a little sketchy when you consider that a bank envelope full of cash was left behind at the crime scene. Another part of this story is that Burt and his gang were almost caught when an SBI agent happened upon the Durham's GMC Jimmy after it had been ditched along the side of the road. Even the SBI agent at the time, Wallace Hardwick, he and Gary Morgan, who was a former highway patrolman, they actually drove by uh, the GMC Jimmy. It was still running. They looked inside and they saw this, this silver service and stuff. They saw it in the car, and they didn't, you know, they stopped. They, they didn't just to look in and make sure that, no, hey, there's this, this GMC Jimmy that's stuck in the ditch out here. Um, they didn't think anything of it, so they went on to the Durham home. And they didn't really, they, they didn't connect with that. The two men must have happened upon the still-running GMC mere minutes after it was abandoned, but thought nothing of it. And really, why would they? No, you wouldn't, other than it's it was so unusual. Yeah, and it was a four-wheel drive. It's like, ah, you know, somebody slipped off the road. Eh, we're used to that. We see it. 
Just then, Agent Hardwick received the call that there was a homicide at the Durham's home. He had just missed the killers. But I discovered that the killers may have almost been caught even before this incident. Um, I'm Allison Baugh Marcotte, and I was raised in Millers Creek, North Carolina. Allison Marcotte has a story that has been passed down through her family since the night the murders occurred. That is, on the rare occasion that they would actually speak of it. All the information that I have from February 3rd of 1972 is just what my family has told me. At that time, my parents lived in Boone, North Carolina, and my brother was nine. My mother was pregnant with me. My dad's family was in uh, Millers Creek, North Carolina, and so they went to visit them for that evening, probably to have dinner with them. It had started to snow, and my dad said to my mom, we probably should leave because it's so hard to get up the hill that they lived on, which was the Clyde Townsend Road. In 1972, the road that Allison's family lived on was unnamed, but would later be changed to Clyde Townsend Road, the name it still bears today. Her family lived directly across the street from the Durhams. They started home, and sure enough, my dad gets stuck on the street because it it's extremely steep. He gets stuck and he says, I'm going to go to the neighbor's house, which is across the street from their home, and I'm going to see if they can maybe help me get up the road. My dad goes to the door. He knocks on the door. No one comes to the door, and he can see that people are in there, and he can hear people. And he gets, you know, kind of upset, and he goes back to my mom, and he said, I knocked on the door and rang the doorbell, and nobody's coming to the door. Uh... But I can see people. It's so weird. This must have stuck out as very odd behavior to Allison's father. Because again, we've heard that this was a time when everyone knew everyone, left their doors unlocked, and would always help a neighbor out in a bind. They ended up getting the car up the road. I don't know how. But then they settled in for the evening. I think it had, at that point, had been um, pretty late They settled in for the evening, and then early, early the next morning, they had the police knocking on their door, questioning them about events from the night before because their neighbors were brutally murdered in that home, all three of them. When I think about, when I read the articles about Billy Wayne Davis, he did mention that they almost got caught that night, and that had to have been my dad knocking on the door. Allison's father was questioned by police because his footprints were found in the snow leading up to the front door. But he had a solid alibi, and it went no further than that. For her family, these murders were enough to make them leave Boone and never return. I never even knew that it was their neighbors because my mom would always speak of it as the Boone murders. And the way that she would explain it to me was almost like it was a serial killer. Uh, My mom was very shook by this. They ended up moving back to New Hampshire shortly after that. My mom was really upset. She never spoke of it, never told me about it. I think my mother really, really was so bothered by this because um, she instantly, she didn't go back to the house. Like she went back to the house to get belongings and left. I think that they moved here to New Hampshire because that's where her family is. My mom's family's here. And I think she wanted to be with family. She was so shook by this. This is just one example of how these murders affected the lives of people outside of the Durham family's circle. Allison then told me something that caught me completely off guard. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name 
Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. In 1968, law enforcement from across the South held a secret meeting to discuss a loose-knit gang terrorizing the region. The Dixie Mafia. It's a brotherhood of criminals who've done just about everything from organized drug rings to murdering elected officials. Throughout the 60s and 70s, cops hunted down key figures of the Dixie Mafia, including its enigmatic ringleader, Kirksey Nix. I'm an outlaw, but I'm far from being the psychopathic nutcase I've been made out to be. Fifteen years into Kirksey's life sentence, the Dixie Mafia was practically folklore, but that would soon change. Mississippi Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were assassinated in their Biloxi home. This wasn't random. Was he the target? Was she the target? Did the mayor have anything to do with this? If somebody was going to die. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South, a documentary podcast from C13 Originals, a Cadence 13 studio. Season 2, The Dixie Mafia. Available now on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, I always thought when I first started reading about it and knowing, when I started listening to the In the Red Clay, I just couldn't help but feel like my dad could have been the one that they were gunning for. because of he was always um, getting in trouble. And I remember even as when I was a child that he did get beat up one time because of gambling debt. They probably didn't feel like that was the case. That was just me thinking, man, this seems so like my dad. You know, when you started talking about uh, Billy Burton and the Dixie Mafia and the gambling and the moonshine and you know, all that stuff. I was just like, wow, this is like kind of hits home a little bit. What if they were going after my family because it was a mother, a father, a son, and they got the wrong family, you know? Literally across the street, right? Right across the street. And it's almost like across, a like you're almost like a shared driveway, basically, because that's how small the road is. While this might sound like a stretch, is it really that hard to imagine? Her family makeup at the time was the same as the Durham's, a father, mother, and young son. They lived directly across the street. There were blizzard conditions, which could have caused confusion. Could her father have owed a gambling debt, or was he thought to have had gambling winnings in the house? The Dixie Mafia was heavily involved in gambling, and killed for much less. And the Durham family had no known enemies or shady dealings that they were involved in. What if the killers did target the wrong people? The phone call that Jenny Durham and her husband, Troy Hall, received from Virginia during the attack initially led police down a different path. Troy said that when he briefly spoke with Virginia, she provided a simple description of the assailants. He tells Jenny, like, you know, your mom said that there's blacks and they're killing Bobby and Bryce. And then the phone goes dead. Investigators began their search for suspects believing they were African-American, based on what Troy Hall told them was relayed to him by Virginia Durham. But it quickly led nowhere. And this is the first hole that is punched in this story, because shortly after, three more suspects would come into the picture that would result in arrests just two months after the murders. Well, one of them was already in jail for other things. And, okay, he, so. and he is the one who made the statement that implicated the other two that were then arrested. While in Boone, I met with local historian Terry Harmon, and he filled me in on the initial suspects. It all started 
with one man. Dean Chandler. He had already been arrested for some break-ins in the Asheville area. Sheriff Ponder, he was the sheriff of Madison County. He was trying to break up this big theft ring in that area, Madison County, Buncombe County. But that, that was happening kind of simultaneously with the Durham murders. But, you know, he hears of the Durham murders, obviously. And he's kind of like, well, you know, that was a break-in potentially. There was some stuff taken, ransacking. You know, is that related to these guys down here breaking into houses? So as they arrest people, they're questioning them and trying to determine would there be any connection. And initially, they don't find that there is. Dean Chandler was a local crook from the nearby city of Asheville, North Carolina. He was in jail in April of 1972 for other crimes. But he said he knew exactly what happened to the Durhams and exactly who did it. He tells this elaborate story. It's a really amazing story and actually quite believable. I mean, to read it, you think, wow, I see how all this really could have unfolded this way. But then Dean Chandler... There again, you've got a situation where somebody's charged with other crimes and they see this as a chance to, well, maybe I, maybe if I acquiesce and admit to some things in this, they'll cut me a deal, which means I won't go to prison for these other things. He had in his mind that he was going to get the reward money for giving the tips that lead to the conviction of the killers. From jail, Chandler tells authorities a story of how he and three other men Eugene Guerin, Jerry Casada, and Dewey Coffey worked together to rob houses all over North Carolina. His job was to case houses that might be good to burglarize and report back to the others in exchange for a cut of the take. He came with his wife to town and cased the houses while the other two guys were robbing other places in other counties. And then they agreed to meet back in Marion, North Carolina, and he was going to kind of report to them. These are the these are the couple of houses identified in Boone that you can hit later tonight. So he implicates Jerry Casada and Eugene Guerin and Dewey Coffee. Early in the day, on February 3rd, 1972, Chandler identified the Durham's home as a place to hit and reported it to the others who returned later that night only to stumble upon the Durham's at home. That's when things escalated inside the home and led to the murders. Or at least, that's how Chandler's story went. He was convincing. Having concocted a story that described every move he made, where and when he met these other men, what they were driving, conversations they had. He even described seeing one of the men as being wet from the waist down when they returned from the Durham's home on the night of the robbery. The three other men implicated were arrested, and in June of 72, a court date was set. This is where Chandler's story begins to unravel. Well, Dean Chandler didn't even come to the probable cause hearing. He refused to testify. But he's the one who's thinking he's, he's going to get a deal, and it's becoming evident that he's not going to get a deal. And part of the problem was, before Chandler made his statement, Sheriff Ponder drove him to Boone to the Durham house, showed him where the house was, what the neighborhood looked like. Obviously, when Chandler's then telling his story, he's able to incorporate this Oddly, he gets the color of the house wrong in his statement. And then there were accusations that, that Sheriff Carroll, Ward Carroll of Watauga County, had, had told Chandler that he would be eligible for the reward money. The reward money that Chandler was after reached upwards of $40,000, which was a pretty penny in the 70s. Claims were made that the sheriff of Madison County, North Carolina, which sits just outside of Asheville, was colluding with Chandler, giving him details of the murder, and actually took him to the Durham's home so he could accurately describe it in court to better sell his story. Then things really fell apart. He did tell him there was a reward, and I think even had shown him some of the checks that had been sent in by individuals. At the probable cause hearing, they find that there is no probable cause against Garin and Coffee, so they're released. They feel like there is probable cause for Chandler and Casada, so they charge them with the murders, and they're scheduled for their trials. 
Chandler's trial came up first, and they just did a null process with leave, which basically says we can't prosecute you, but with leave means that if something surfaces in the days ahead, we could come back and try you for it, and that never happened. Casada's trial was last, and same thing there. They never had the trial. They didn't prosecute him. No evidence. It was all really hinging on Chandler's statement, which they were saying he actually made up because of these reasons. Because he was trying to cut a deal, he thought he could get the reward money. Any hopes of speaking with these three men today is gone. And they're all deceased now. I don't, I'm not sure any of them lived past their 60s. In the years that followed the Chandler debacle, the case grew cold. Tips were few and far between, and not much traction was made. As the city and its problems grew, the Durham investigation took a back seat. The case had sort of waned because it was kind of like there's really no, nothing forthcoming. Nobody's talking. We're not finding anything new. But even though the investigation seems to have stalled, authorities did still have a person of interest in mind. Someone who was a suspect from day one. It wasn't Chandler, Casada, or Coffee. It wasn't Billy Sunday Burt or Billy Wayne Davis. It was someone a little closer to home for the Durham family. When we were investigating, I mean, I think in our gut somewhere, we, it just didn't add up. The suspect, in, in my mind, who I thought did it, I couldn't interview him anymore. It was just Troy Hall. We were suspecting Troy from almost day one. That has all the signs of a local yokel. These people are dying. She's listening to guys beat them in the other room, and she calls Troy. She calls Troy, the same guy they despise, and he comes to the rescue. Man, how far in our space do we go? Everything was done on Troy Hall's timeline. Everything. Nobody could have done that except Troy Hall. In the Red Clay is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and recorded the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Sound design by Shane Freeman. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Season two of In the Red Clay, Durham, is a six-episode series with new episodes available every Monday. To keep up with this and my other podcasts, follow me on social media at Sean Kipe. Have questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. If you like the series, tell your friends and leave us a review. Thanks for listening.